This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. Corinthians 15, verse 35. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and star differs from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that, has, that is sown is perishable, the ra- it is raised imperishable, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man was from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth and as is the man from heaven so also are those who are from heaven who are of heaven just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven amen i declare to you brothers and sisters that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable listen i tell you a mystery We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. Hello everyone, good evening. It is fantastic. Um, I normally get away fixtures these days, so it's nice to have a home tie for once. Um, For once, sorry. Uh, It's it's wonderful to be with you this evening um, and to be looking at this incredible passage in 1 Corinthians. I have to admit, when I put my hand up, I hadn't checked what the passage was. I'm so delighted uh, to to preach on this tonight. It's a real privilege. Uh, I've been convinced as I've been thinking about it this week and to be honest, because uh, a very distinguished lecturer in college is preaching on it next week, um, that this is a really important passage in the New Testament. In fact, I think it might be one of the key passages in all of Scripture. It's one of those places where the Apostle Paul teaches us really plainly, really clearly, about what he believes probably would be the most important thing of all. And so I pray that as we look at it tonight, and I must warn you now, we're not going to rush it, but as we look at it tonight, um, the Spirit will speak to us and minister to us through it as he already has been through our worship this evening and thank you to Mark especially thank you to Sam thank you to Kirsty for leading us already let's pray let's pray and get some help before we start <coughs> Heavenly Father every letter of your word speaks to us because you are the God who speaks Lord give us ears to listen to you now with the truth of your gospel defeat every remnant of death that lurks in our hearts And instead, capture our minds to focus on your glory alone. In the most holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 
John on the left of this picture was born in 1921. He grew up in a farming family in North Antrim. As a young man, he traveled to Dublin to train as a veterinarian. Eventually, he took up a job in County Tyrone and he moved to the center of the universe, Cookstown. He met a woman called Anna on the left who spied him across the street one day and she was smitten. They married, they built a house close to her family home, they raised three children. They were faithful members of the church, dedicated a significant amount of time serving others. By most human measures, John lived a modest but fulfilling life. He was respected by his peers and adored by his grandchildren, who he kept supplied with tools, weapons, fruit pastels, and factual instruction. I like to think I was his favorite. I didn't think it would be this hard to say though. I think my cousins feel differently. At his funeral, I hit my cousin Johnny in the head with a cricket bat twice. <laughs> John died in August 1998, the day after the Oma bombing. He was age 77. He died, his body broken with cancer, just another hospital bed in Antrim Area Hospital. Because regardless of the life or the status of any man, woman or child, death comes for us all. The grief of the death of those we love. The crippling fear we may feel of our own future death. It is guaranteed. Death doesn't discriminate between the sinners and the saints. It just takes and it takes and it takes. Until eventually it takes the only thing we have left. Ourselves. And in our secular culture today, you know, the collective wisdom is that that is the end of the story. Everyone and every, everything that we know that has any kind of life, and as we'll see plenty of things that don't, everything dies. But the Apostle Paul, as we've just heard, thinks otherwise. In Acts 23, we get the first of these scenes. Paul is hauled in front of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. It's the first of a series of legal trials at the end of Acts. They keep escalating. His prosecution moves again and again up through the courts. And it will take him all the way to the seat of power in Rome. But when pressed to declare why he is before the court, his statement in Acts 23 verse 6 is the same that he repeats in every trial. In Acts 24 verse 15, 24 verse 21, and 26 verse 8, Paul says, I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. Paul is on trial because of his belief in the truth, that no matter what our sinful enemy tries to convince us of, death has been defeated. Sin has been conquered. Christ is our hope in life and death. He was John's hope. I pray that as we look through this passage tonight, you will be convinced or be reminded in the strongest possible terms that he is your hope too. You'll need your Bibles open. I know a lot of people do already, but please, if you could... Uh, turn back to 1 Corinthians 15. We're looking at verse 35 onwards. I want to take an opportunity tonight through the prism of the argument that Paul puts together so masterfully to review the Bible's biggest theme. So please, as we do this, ask yourself, ask yourself honestly, do you, like Paul, have hope in the resurrection of the dead? We sometimes translate the idiom to believe in, in my heart. In the Bible, believe it in our hearts. Often actually what it's translating is the expression to believe it in our bowels. It's a really deep, deep in your gut, pit of your stomach kind of belief. Do we really believe in the resurrection of the dead that deeply? Well, let's see. Over the past couple of Sunday nights, we've heard about Paul's first two sections of this chapter. Firstly, the apostle has reminded the Corinthians of the core gospel message, 15 verse 3. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then Paul describes the hundreds and hundreds of eyewitnesses who could testify to having seen the risen Jesus. And remember for this first audience, those are people that they could go and ask about seeing the risen Jesus. And then secondly, we heard last week, he picked apart a series of objections to the resurrection, concluding 15 verse 20... That Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits 
of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. So now Paul presents the climax of this letter. It has all been building to this. This is his concluding argument. And as he begins in verses 35 to 44, we get a series of really interesting illustrations. The first is this series of contrasts between types of bodies. Consider seeds, which are effectively dead, only to spring new life in a different form. People, animals, birds, fish, all carbon-based, sometimes fleshy bodies, but in a wide variety of forms. Planets, the moons, the moons, stars, generally all made out of the same, roughly the same materials. I have a child who is obsessed with the periodic table at the moment. They're all roughly the same materials, but shaped by God into a whole range of glorious shapes. <coughs> What's Paul's point? Verse 42, so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. <coughs> now firstly, the perishable. All of these bodies, even stars in space, are perishable. This is an exploding star. Again, great way to enter, enter, yeah, entertain small boys. Everything will end. Everything that you can perceive in this created order, for as long as this created order lasts, has a moment in time where, in theory, it will no longer be. We can't hide from it. You can take all the treatments and injections and programs and things that you sign up through your phone. But you just not talk about it and pretend it's not going to happen. It's going to happen. But it's not the end. It's only the beginning. Because the body that is sown is perishable, but it is raised imperishable. Paul says it's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. And then this concept that is vital for us to understand properly in verse 44. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. We need to explain this a little bit. I worry that at, at face value, some may still read this and go, oh, well, okay, so, so this perishable body dies, but what does our culture believe? I'll be raised as some kind of spirit to go and float in the clouds like a Looney Tunes cartoon. But that's not it. We need to look no further than Jesus to understand the distinction that Paul is making. Verse 20 said, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So verse 20, which we referred to earlier, tells us what Paul has in mind. Christ is the model here. Jesus was not resurrected as some kind of ghost. When Thomas, Frank described it brilliantly for us this morning, when Thomas the disciple sees him along with the others in the upper room in John 20, Jesus invites him to touch him to feel his literal wounds in order to see he is flesh, he is truly man. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus eat and drink with him, as do the disciples on the beach when they eat breakfast together. When Mary encounters him in the garden, I think she grabs hold of her master so tightly that he says, John 20, verse 17, do not hold on to me. The word could be translated as cling. Don't cling to me. It was an early heresy in the second and third century that Jesus was never really actually, never actually human, not like us. Rather, God in a spiritual form occupied something that looked like a human body. We may be guilty of a softer version of this in our own minds. Yes, yes, fully God, fully man, I think I've, I've got my head around that, but not, not, not really a human, not really. <coughs> what you want to see is a bunch of theological students debating whether Jesus could stub his toe. That was, an, that was an hour of my life this time. <laughs> but friends, if Jesus is not fully divine and fully human, the whole thing doesn't hang together. Because in order to be the perfect fulfillment of God's law, as given to humans, the second person of the Holy Trinity had to fulfill it as a human. I'll come back to that more in a moment. 
but it follows that he was also resurrected as a human. And now, perpetually, and until the end of time, he intercedes in the heavenly sanctuary, Hebrews tells us, for us, fully God and fully human, but in his resurrected form, more fully human, more fully alive than we can ever conceive. That is the spiritual body that Paul is speaking of. A body that perfectly expresses the spirit of each man and woman. And that is what awaits those who are resurrected by the Lord because of their trust in Jesus. A body like the resurrected Christ. We rightly talk about striving to imitate and be like Jesus in our lives. Some days it goes better than others, I think. I have guaranteed you that you will die. I don't think that was a surprise. Let me now also guarantee you. If you trust Jesus Christ as your Saviour and Lord, I guarantee you, you will also be resurrected with him and be like him in his perfect humanity. He's still God. We're not. He will always be greater than us because the divine nature is for him alone. But, nevertheless, we will be made whole in real imperishable bodies. Paul's second point in verses 44 to 49 explain this distinction between the natural body, verse 44, and the spiritual body. He goes on for verse 45. It is written, the first Adam became a living being. Now he's quoting Genesis 2 verse 7. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Verse 49, there is a gap between the image of our earthly father, Adam, and our heavenly father. Now, this gap is worth dwelling on because it reminds us of the source and the curse of death and sin. Some of you will know we have a boys' discipleship group that meets here on a Tuesday night. There's enough of them here, I'm going to say this. If any of them are here, well, they are here. Uh, of all of the things that I have to step away from in the next few months, that's the one I'm feeling the most about. Even family Felix. <laughs> I mention it because we've been slowly working our way through the start of Genesis. Uh, and seeing that the start, particularly Genesis chapter 1 to 3, is really the setup, it's not just the introduction, it is the foundation of the whole of Scripture. We have the two creation narratives, and then we have the betrayal by Adam and Eve that sets in motion everything that follows. God creates order out of chaos. He creates a garden, he places man in it to work it, subdue it, multiply, fill it. And as it expands to fill the earth, create the temple city that we get that amazing picture of in Revelation 21 and 22. But, as we know, in Genesis 3, disharmony appears. The serpent invites the humans to consider turning away from God, and they do it. The order becomes disordered. Sin is entered. As Paul writes elsewhere, Romans 5 verse 12, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. God concludes the curse in Genesis 3 verse 19 by saying to the man, for dust you are, his name's Adam, it means ground, for dust you are and to dust you will return. Now things will die. And death is because of human choice. If you don't believe me, you could Look a few verses later, Genesis 4, verse 7. God's speaking to Cain. Sees what's in his heart. Sees what he's about to do. And the Lord says, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Cain could have mastered it. But he chooses the way of death instead. He can't kill God in his anger, so he kills Abel, God's image bearer, instead. And so human history becomes a cycle of sin and death in ever-decreasing circles. And this is the way of the natural body. Our earthly father is the broken Adam. The man of the ground who was tested and found unworthy. But there is a second Adam. Not as a natural body, but of the spiritual body. And he is worthy. The tempter came to him in the wilderness... Sin crouched at his door, and he mastered it. If the moral, perfect law of God, which no earthly man was able to keep, was before him, and he kept it perfectly. The 
doors of the grave were before him. They seized him. They brought him in. But they could not hold him. So although, verse 50, logic dictates that the perishable, that's us, cannot inherit the imperishable because of this gap. The perishable cannot inherit the glorious riches of God's inheritance of being in his holy presence, more fully alive and more fully realized than we can possibly, let's be honest, we can possibly comprehend. Though those under the curse of death cannot enter in, because of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, everything has changed. There's the bodies we inhabit in this life, afflicted by the marks of sin and death, until eventually death will claim them. There is the picture we are trying to grasp of Christ in his exalted, fully God, yet still also fully human form, which gives us some sense of what he is offering to us. But as we come to the climax and try and put these two things together, we must heed the challenge ahead of us in verse 53. For the perishable, must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. Now you are all, I know, or mostly all, good Presbyterians. We gained another 21 this morning, that's great. If I were to ask you what saves you from sin and death, you will say, only trust in Jesus as our Saviour and Lord. There's nothing I can do to save myself. I have to ask for forgiveness for the sin in my life, and wholly trust that through his death and resurrection, Jesus has defeated death. I know you know this. But do you believe it in your bowels? Because I think sometimes we don't live that way. In our activity. Frankly, in our exhaustion. It can look an awful lot like we're working to please God. So we can be saved. Let me go off script here. Ruth, I'm sorry if you're listening at home. The number of pastoral conversations I've had, the number of conversations, not pastoral conversations, just conversations I've had in the last month, where people are at their wits' end, the number of people off work through stress, the number of people who are doing too much, the number of people trying to organize things and then getting very upset that not that many people can come. We are exhausted. As a, as a culture, as an East Belfast culture, I think even as a church, we are exhausted. It can look an awful lot like we're working to please God so we can be saved. Back on screen. Let me say this very clearly. God doesn't need you. God does not need you. Nothing you do has any effect upon him. No sin you commit causes any change in him. No good sin you do causes any change in him. I have found that some people take this very badly. If you're taking that very badly now, right now, Frank's right here. But, <laughs> I'm not back, it's fine. But it's actually a fundamental principle of Scripture. God needs none of us. He is under no obligation to any of us to do anything. Hey, here's a common mistake I think we sometimes make. Sometimes we think about sin and we think God had no choice but to act in redemptive history to stamp out this problem. But he's God. Well, what makes God do anything? Sin has no effect upon him. Nothing has any effect upon him. God is completely free. I have to write 3,000 words about him. And you know what? This is really good news. This is really good news. Because even though all of that is true, the creative God of the universe chooses to love you. He had no obligation to do anything about the people made from dust. But he chose to do everything. I almost feel like I want everyone to lean forward with me here a little bit. Because I want to tell you, I want to tell you very specifically, I never imagined myself doing something like this. This is important. You are so important. You are so valued. You are so known, and fellowship with you, friendship with you, but deeper than that, is so desired by the Lord our God that he entered time and space as a child. He grew and resisted all of the evil and pain in the world around him. He remained sinless throughout. 
and then offered his blood through a torturous, brutal death to be the perfect sacrifice for your sin. Again, even now, the book of Hebrews tells us Jesus is resurrected, risen, ascended, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of grace. What's he doing? He's continuing to intercede for you. And you have nothing to contribute except to believe in him. Believe in him. Trust in him. Again, if that's not good news, you might as well go home. Paul says, quoting Isaiah in verse 32, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. But it is true. If you sit in these pews tonight or any night and you've not accepted it, please listen. Everything that you feel is wrong can be forgiven. With Jesus as your Savior, the Lord will look on your perishable body and see only the imperishable that has been placed over it, clothed over it. He will only see Jesus. You should see only Jesus too. I need a long display. With this we finish. We move to verse 51 onwards. And you know what? I, I make no apology for just reading it. Reading it again. Reading from verse 51 here. Follow with me please. Paul writes, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, and then the promise to end all promises when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality and the saying that is written will come true death has been swallowed up in victory where O oh, death is your victory where O oh, death is your sting the sting of sin the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law but thanks be to god he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death is defeated. The enemy which stalks every living thing has no victory. God's good laws for life given in scripture were given to show us the depth of sin and that gap to God. That's what verse 56 is about. That's a whole sermon in itself. That gap has not just been bridged, it's been smashed. Heaven and earth collide as the kingdom of God breaks into creation and Jesus wins. And so, as he often does, Paul finishes by urging you and me through the pages of God's word to stand firm. Verse 58, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Christ has died. He has been resurrected. You will die. And if you trust in Christ, you will be resurrected. Yes, our time on this earth will end. And it may be sooner than you think. But to borrow from C.S. Lewis's wonderful description, if you are in Christ, that when it happens, you will discover that this earthly life was only the beginning of the real story. All your life in this world was only the cover and the title page. And then at last you will begin chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, and in which every chapter is better than the one before. And so Jesus says to us all tonight, John 11, verses 26, 27. I am the resurrection of the life. Whoever believes in me, though he shall die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you? Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. 
We're a congregation in East Belfast. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org. Thank you.